Welcome to the Institute of Cervantes at Harvard University, and welcome to this event, which belongs belong to a series uh, by the uh, co-sponsored uh, by the Provostial Fund for Arts and Humanities, the Charles Warren Center for, for Studies in American History, the Committee on Ethnicity and Migration Rights, the David Rockefeller Center for Latin America Studies, and the Committee on Degrees in History and Literature. As you can see, we are many, many friends all together uh, to celebrate something worthy, National Poetry Month. And nothing better to celebrate this Poetry Month um, with a, than with a Latino, Latina, or Latinx uh, poetry reading. This observatorio belongs to, the, um, to a worldwide uh, organization named Instituto Cervantes, a governmental, uh, governmental institution from Spain, Instituto Cervantes, is a network of centers uh, to teach Spanish and offer libraries and cultural events. So today it's not possible to, to sell uh, your books in this place, but instead the names of Elizabeth Azevedo, Peggy Robles Alvarado, and Daniel Legros George are being acknowledged in 90 cities in 44 countries, which are with, uh, where Instituto Cervantes is settled. The observatory hosts seminars, conferences, and debates among other academic activities, in order to promote uh, in Harvard uh, Spanish and the Latino uh, culture, uh, culture and thought also. Let me say finally, it's a real pleasure to um, collaborate with Melissa Castillo, coordinator of this event, and uh, welcome to Elizabeth uh, Acevedo, Peggy uh, Robles Alvarado, and Daniel Legros uh, George. Thank you for being here, and thank you all for attending this this event and for visiting the Instituto Cervantes at Harvard. Welcome, and Melissa, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first to the Instituto, they have been amazing collaborators and supporters. Um, of this event, um, some of our first collaborators, and so I'm so pleased to be here for a second time. Um, and I'm really um, thankful to have all of you today um, to celebrate National Poetry Month. It really means a lot, and it really means a lot, I think, to do it uh, with a uh, Latinx-themed reading. Um, I feel incredibly honored um, to have Danielle Legros George, um, who is our Boston Poet Laureate. Um, I think what an honor to have her be a part of this series. Um, she is a professor in the Creative Arts and Learning Division at Lesley University. Her work has been published in a wide variety of publications, <coughs> including the Boston Globe, World Literature Today, the Caribbean Writer, Calibou, Poesis, the American Poetry Review, and she is author of the collection Maroon. Thank you so much, and uh, I'll let you take it away. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Instituto Cervantes. Thank you, Melissa, for the invitation. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from my, my fellow, my sister poets this afternoon. Uh, the first poem I will read is, um, has to do with a well-known figure in uh, Caribbean culture and letters um, by the name of Ana Kauna. Uh, she was the ruler of one of the five regions of Haiti, or Hispaniola, which is the island shared by Haiti and the Dominican Republic at the time of Columbus's arrival in 1492. And she sought to unite the uh, five regions against the colonizers, but was ambushed and murdered in her uh, attempt. But nonetheless, she stands as a, um, a great figure in uh, colonial resistance, a great uh, female uh, leader. Uh, and her name in Arawak uh, means golden flower. So tonight I'm going to read some poems having to do with history. Anakauna. Can you hear me? OK. And my name will be dropped. Golden leaf, flower, gold, gold. The gold of mountains beyond mountains I've crossed to behold my own face. Despite my body's death in double cross by a gentleman's deal, the sword, the crucifix, Despite divisions of time, of tribes, Taino, Carib, 
the island's body itself, its zones, Marien, Magua, Maguana, Higüe, Jaragua, engulfed, transfigured, my own children scattered, the poets lost, their tongues scattered, my name buried by music foreign to me, the mountain sides bursting in red, my gestures marooned. I have seen what will be, the mirroring gaze through time, the sun in eclipse, reflection and reflection, an imprint of my face, the study of my aim, and my name will so maze. My name will breed vision. My girls will be black, bronzed, fair. Their eyes will be storms. And my name dropped, golden leaf, flower, gold, gold, the gold of mountains beyond mountains I have crossed to behold my own face. I um, recently, well, uh, uh, over a year ago, was commissioned to write poems about the black presence and the presence of color in New England um, just prior to uh, the U.S., the American Revolution, and then, sh and then through to the Second Revolution, uh, the Transcendental Movement um, uh, uh, founded in, in Concord, Massachusetts. And so I was in the Concord Free Library doing some research about that and came across a bill of sale um, for a two-year-old girl, which just struck me. Um, and so, uh, wrote a poem about it. <laughs> uh, this poem is, in call, is entitled, Poem as Bill of Sale in Sight of Stifled Rage and Sorrow. Um, and and I, as I was doing this research, of course, um, the connections between um, the Americas, the, the Caribbean, Africa, and, and New England were, were uh, underscored for me. And finally, there are some crossed out parts. I'm going to, the, the first half of the poem is, is the actual bill of sale. And, um, and there are some words that are crossed out, so I'm going to make this gesture to indicate that, to indicate the words that have been crossed out. Poem as bill of sale and sight of stifled rage and sorrow. Bill of sale for enslaved two-year-old girl, Violet. Name crossed out and changed to Nancy. Know all men by these presents that I, William Wilson of Concord, in the country of Mid in the county of Middlesex of New England, for the sum of thirty pounds to me secured and paid by Sarah Melvin of said Concord, widow do hereby fully and absolutely sell, grant, convey, and pass over to Sarah Melvin, her heirs and assigns forever, a certain Negro girl being a slave about two years old called Violet, Nancy, to be to her, her heirs and assigns for her and their use and service during the said Negro girl's natural life, hereby for myself, heirs, executors, and administrators, warranting her, Negro girl, to her, said Sarah Melvin, her heirs and assigns from the legal claims or demands of any person. Witness my hand and seal, April 22nd, A.D., 1740, Witnesses Thomas Jones, Thomas Miles, 
William Wilson. Bill of sale for enslaved two-year-old girl. Baby Violet. Name sustained and repeated many times. Violet. 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 Violet, 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 violet. Violet, 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 violet. Witness my hand and seal the day she is born. Witnesses, mother, father, midwife who brings this child into the world. This is um, another poem in that series. Um, it's called Oral Exam. And I was looking at uh, Phyllis Wheatley, who many of you know as uh, the mother of African American uh, literature. She was the first African American to, to publish a book of poetry in the United States. She was born in uh, the Senegal or, or Gambia and came over. Uh, as part of the slave trade and, and was uh, adopted, I guess, <laughs> uh, here in Boston. And uh, she wrote these wonderful uh, poems. And um, before it was uh, time to publish uh, her book of poems in the United States, she needed some blurbs. And so um, there was a group convened of 18 um, men of high standing in the, in the colony who could attest to the fact that she had indeed written her own poem. So they gave her an, a quiz, in, in essence. Uh, and these 18 men included the, the governor and the lieutenant governor of the Commonwealth at the time. So I tried to, I tried to imagine that moment for, um, for Phyllis Wheatley, that moment of, her, of that quiz or that oral exam. So this is the poem. Phyllis Wheatley. Before her examiners, coaxes the mists from their daybeds, retrieves the crescent moon, places it in the palms of their hands, draws the stars she beheld on the deck of the ship Phyllis as she left its depths, seized as Persephone from the earth. Which is the dark and what the light? Where the land devoted to the god of day may be the questions to determine this girl is not a talking dog, a fanciful parrot from whom divine sound spills like a glowing ember. Which gods act as gods and which as mere mortals? What query hangs like ice in air to be dissolved in her gaze? Now she binds reason and doubt, transects the great chain of being, the very stake of this, aware in the flare of an amassed awareness in the systems of revolving worlds. I'm thinking at once, Arisha, as many as one can dream of, plus always one more. I'm thinking of the flight home, the angel Jabril's 600 wings, the Senegambian stars, a mother's libation to the rising sun, as an exuberant fragment of memory. Seven, as her number of original years before the looping and infinite eight, the eight that returns us to the room 
to the 18 noteworthy men in question and Phyllis before them, moving heaven and earth. I'm going to close with um, a poem having to do with childhood uh, and on a lighter note. Um, I'm Haitian. Oops. Yes, IT. <laughs> we, IT. See, <laughs> IT. Um, and we Haitians have this really nasty habit of kissing people when we encounter them, which I think we share with most of, most of our Latin American <laughs> brothers and sisters, right? right? Yes. So, um, you know, so this is, this is how to kiss. The children know how to kiss. To descend stairwells when called into rooms of colored lips, whispered entendres, demure smiles. The uncle who un creole calls us cochon marron, wild pigs. We walk into crooned como vatus, rolling too long from gold-filled mouths, sisly jowls, we kiss the cheek, the next cheek, and more cheeks, the odors of Vitalis, the smart man's hair tonic, of Ben Champagne, Chanel number no. five, Eau de Floride, various adult O's. We bristle in advance against the teenager whose five o'clock shadow goes from sun yard to sit in parlors, his knees eclipsed in cloth, a foreshadow that we too would be the kissed. But Pascal had the audacity once to alter form, opening her mouth to snake a tongue that swept beige powder from the face of Madame Altagrasse, la vache. <laughs> Exposing a patch of brown, girl, <laughs> <laughs> from chin to ear. Un véritable scandale. <laughs> Tongue on cheek. Truth, indeed, the wild pigs. Thank you. Thank you so much again for, for being here. Um, so we were a little late in starting because this, this uh, poet here came straight from the Bronx driving like a mad woman to come here and I really appreciate it, thank you. So uh, next we're gonna have Peggy Robles Alvarado. She is a tenured New York City educator with graduate degrees in elementary and bilingual education. She is a 2017 Pushcart Prize nominee a Canto Mundo Academy for Teachers and Homeschool Fellow, as well as a two-time International Latino Book Award winner. She is author of Conversations with My Skin and Homage to the Warrior Woman and some other things as well. Um, and I know of at least four books, right? Um, I'm very proud to say all four of those books are now part of the Harvard Library Connection uh, collection. So um, get them from her, but also, you know, Feel free to use the library as well. Um, so thank you, Peggy. I apologize for my tardiness. I, I ha my children were state tested today, and I had to be there. And you know, it's it's horrible to see an eight-year-old child having a panic attack. So I had to deal with all of that this morning, yesterday, and this morning. So and then I quickly faked an emergency so I can be here. So, <laughs> so um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here and sharing this evening. Thank you to my fellow ladies. Um, I am a Dominican Boricua from New York and my story is very unique. So I am many things. I am a college graduate. I am currently a college student. I'm gonna graduate in May. 
I'm gonna get my MFA. Um, but I'm also I'm also a former teen mom. So the first piece that I'm gonna share with all of you is based on that experience. Um, and being a teen mom and going to college and trying to then have a relationship, a normal relationship, did not work. So that's how this poem came to be. So to all the boys in college who decided not to date me after finding out I was a single mother. <laughs> a girl with a kid has too many problems, you said. I'm not ready to deal with all that drama, you said. I'm not ready to be a daddy, you said, after I proudly declared I was mother to a little girl who loved to dance and finger paint. Disappointment dominated your face. All possibilities of becoming your girl lost. I was now placed in a new group, a different bracket, a special contact list reserved for pretty hoes, undeserving of your intimate whispers over candlelight, unfit for the caress of your fingertips, because to you, my curves were baptized by fire, seasoned too soon. Your hands were still wet with post-pubescent inexperience and sweat, soaked with the false sense of machista manhood that rendered you incapable of understanding the depths of my ocean. Didn't bother to stare deeply into my eyes because the thought of my once lactating breast secretly turned you on, reminded you of the day your mother declared you too old to latch on and you resented her for it. After my declaration, our conversations were cut short, brief, curt, quick questions like, can I come over after the club? Can I pass by your crib? Can I hit it? Good enough to fuck but not to feed. Good enough to bag but not worth any real time, energy, respect, dignity. Besides, you thought I wasn't enough. I was never quite enough. Not tall enough, not thin enough, not quiet enough, and certainly not tame enough. You can't make this presenta your preferida. Besides, I didn't have the time to cater to your insecurities, to watch you walk through your life set on average, witness you belittle your mother for not having done your laundry, applaud you for being satisfied with the bare minimum, listen to you blame your missing daddy for your lack of parental instincts, reassure you by saying, it was the biggest I had ever seen before, please. <laughs> I didn't have the time, because the need to feed all the hollow spaces in my soul claimed priority. I was nourishing a thick skin with a determination to affix my own labels, rearranged all the scarlet letters on my chest to create poetry, no longer willing to be anyone's disappointment. My descendancy stems from estrogen too strong to be held in contempt, too expansive to be held captive, too potent to succumb to people's preconceived inconsistencies, so please don't confuse my being single for being lonely, bitter, empty. I am selective. No need to fabricate fairy tales or fantasies when the trial and error of being a single mother was my reality. Walking a tightrope between what was expected of me and how much I could actually do holding my breath when two jobs still couldn't pay the bills, holding my eyes to finish term papers when exhaustion settled, holding back tears just to keep my daughter believing I was strong, held myself together with emotional armor and education, hoping to one day forsake and replace all this goddamn heartache, to find someone who would see my daughter as more than just an impediment or a mistake, esa niña, who I vowed would not live off food stamps forever, deserved more. La hija de esta perceived puta was willing to make space for someone who can make her mommy smile. So as you were counting all my faults, tallying up my have-nots, filling in the column of cons, you forgot to add that I am nobody's pillow princess. I'm not cut from the cloth of complacency or satisfied with what is. I'm not resolved to living in my social caste. I'm not willing to blindly and unknowingly give you my ass. I'm not the daughter of pendeja or naive. I'm not the cousin to a stupida simpleton or too afraid to watch you leave. Because all of this is worth the time. All of this is worth the wait. All of this is worth the hands of a real man. And I was never meant to be your girl. Because I was too much of a woman for you to handle. On a lighter note, I have the illest dry mouth, so if you see my lips getting stuck, you know why. Um, it's allergy season, people. <laughs> so eventually, part of my story, eventually I did find someone who honored all of this, a man with coarse palms and thick hands that knows that the sun and the soil have names, and he happens to be here today, so I'm gonna embarrass him because he's here. So that's my husband, and we've been married for 15 years. And he kind of drove reckless with me. <laughs> he drove real reckless with me. I was like, I need your help. I need to get there. I'm about to die. But um, that's what happens when you're from the Bronx. Um, so we had two boys. And I named them what I feel that their soul 
needed what their soul represented when it came into this dimension. And people have critiqued me for the names of my sons, and even my daughter. They say they're not proper names, they say they're, they're ghetto names, they say that they're too complex. So this piece is born because of that. But it's also inspired by a young man called Jose Zamora, who was featured on Huffington Post a few years back, and he was having so much trouble finding a job. So for Jose, who dropped the S in his name to get a job. The story spread quickly. Jose drops the S, becomes Joe, and gets countless job offers. Email after email of possibilities flooding his inbox. Reading his story, you'd think I'd question my decision to name my sons Indio and Nahuel. Indio, not Indigo. <laughs> Indio. Two syllables of insult in some Latin American countries. Synonymous with illiterate, poor, disenfranchised, thought shameful by the elite. Those who wish we could bleach our identity to an acceptable shade of conformity, call it patriotic. ¿Y por qué no le diste nombre de valor? ¿Algo prestigioso? ¿Eso no es un apodo? Family question, suggesting Arthur, not Arturo, Henry, not Enrique, a name with pedigree, or maybe something with a biblical nature so as to consecrate him with the approval of the status quo. Call it nationalism. If this country cannot handle a Jose, what will they do with Nahuel? Nahuel. Not Noel. Not Noel. Nahuel. Three vowels compressed between two hard consonants, forcing speakers who dare attempt his name to stretch the tongue in new ways. A name reserved for a fictional character in the Twilight series. A venomous hybrid. A popularized fantasy of paganism. ¿Y cómo se escribe eso? ¿Será ese el nombre de algún bisabuelo? Friends question, suggesting John, not Juan, Thomas, not Tomás, a name more pleasing to the ear, easy on the phonemes, because in this country, names are tied to wealth and opportunity. Call it the American way. Indio and Nahuel. They say exotic, foreign, illegitimate. I say delicacy, intricate, authentic written on corn husks and bark paper, wrapped in gold coins, pronounced in a code undecipherable to those who cannot read coffee-stained cups or firestones. A series of pre-colonial astronomical calculations too complex to be solved by those who wish we would politely stay within our designated islands, barrios, ghettos, reservations. And if one day Indio decides to become Ian or Isaac or Nahuel takes to Noah or Nathan like Jose who became Joe, it will be because a one-page resume written in Times New Roman cannot possibly speak to the ancient scrolls that rest on their tongues. The dark hues of their business suits will conceal their azabaches and eleques. Their neatly polished wingtip shoes will be carefully lined with leaves of amaru. Their fedoras adorned with a red loro feather will conceal their crowns and the true meaning of their names. The true meaning of their names will be kept under their tongues, in their belly buttons, at the base of their necks, tightly folded like a resguardo, like a talisman, like an outlaw prayer drum smuggled across an ocean in the belly of a ship, like a jasper gemstone rustled through a rainforest tied to the leg of a hummingbird, like a shaman's medicine bag trafficked past the border, guarded by trigger-happy Minutemen, my sons defying, resisting, refusing to shrink, learning to mask, conceal, disguise, Indio and Nahuel, like Jose, who became Joe and learned the power of his name. Thank you. I'm trying not to get my mouth stuck to my teeth, but it's happening, people. It's happening. Um, <coughs> I am very interested in the ways that language empower or disempower. I'm very interested in the way that languages are political or used for political intentions. Um, and I come from a place where language was intertwined, woven with all sorts of things. Um, we spoke Spanish, then we spoke English, then we spoke Spanglish, and it was never enough. It was always called broken. And I don't think I'm broken. I refuse to say that I am broken, that I am damaged. I'm not broken. I'm complex. And if you don't know that, then maybe I'm not for you. Um, maybe I'm just undecipherable for you. Maybe it's your lack, not mine. So 
I have a te- I, I've been a teacher for 16 years now, and I encounter this with children all the time. You know, I, I taught bilingual education for about nine years, and then transitioned to special ed and special ed inclusion. And I see this all the time, and they tell me I don't speak good. I'm like, you speak. You speak great. That's all that counts. But a lot of my students speak Spanglish, and it's awesome. And it made me think about my own childhood. So this next piece is inspired by speaking Spanglish here at the Instituto Cervantes. <laughs> we speak in Spanglish. Say, hold the they're never inviting me back. <laughs> I'll take some water for that one. <laughs> I'm not gonna quote Cardi B, but okay. okay. <laughs> 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 I know, I'm so bad, sorry. It's a long, you wanna have laugh, right? You wanna go, okay, <laughs> that's good. The questionnaire asked me to indicate my primary language. I checked off other, and in big, bold, blue bubble letters wrote in Spanglish. My Spanglish carries a Gillette under her tongue ready to cut you if you say she's the sister of ghetto Spanish. My Spanglish drops the S to make it ma o meno. <laughs> Switches the R with the L para no botar la suelte. Sw- <laughs> Trills her R's cuando tiene un pique rastrero. And if you question the placement of her accent marks, she will replace them with side eye. <laughs> My Spanglish gets in trouble for falling asleep in church and winking at altar boys. Climbs the fence at High Bridge Pool to swim after hours. My Spanglish burns her eyeliner with a lighter before applying it. My Spanglish can't stop sucking her teeth. My Spanglish knows the difference between coquito and limber, pastelito, empanada, frío, frío, and piragua knows how to carry the weight on her thighs, not her shoulders. My Spanglish cooks farina, tembleque, habichuela con dulce, arroz con leche, calls it all comfort food. My Spanglish knows tamarindo was a popular drink, and it still is. Knows every prince, Hector Lavo, and Fernandito Villalona song by heart. My Spanglish wants to be called sexy, not cute. My Spanglish wants to be called smart before sexy, not cute. Wants to be called beautiful, like the Blanquitas her ex parades around the hood to show how he has moved up and on. My Spanglish mends her broken heart with bachata cortavena de Frank Reyes. Gets drunk to boleros del buki. My Spanglish always clap, clap, claps when the plane lands safely. <laughs> hey. My Spanglish thinks fresca presenta en malcria all compliments. Married her cousin to help him get his green card. Don't let her kiss sleep over anyone's house. My Spanglish has crooks and cops sitting at the same table at her daughter's quinceañera. My Spanglish has a college degree and earns summa cum laude in resting bitch face while riding the two train. <laughs> My Spanglish is Washington Heights before the gourmet fruit markets replace Sea Town. Before tomándose una Heineken in front of el building, jugando domino con la pana, was loitering. Before the New York Times and transplants from Minnesota discovered pegao on BuzzFeed and renamed it Stuck Pot Rice. Oh, My Spanglish is Inwood before it became more affordable than Williamsburg and was renamed Northern Manhattan. My Spanglish spray painted over billboards trying to rename El Condado de la Salsa, the Piano District. Wonders if it would have made more sense to name us the Bombay Plena District, the home of Hip Hop District, or the Boogie Down District. But my Spanglish is certain that the Bronx has always been and will forever be art. My Spanglish knows a fire escape is also a terrace. Mm -hmm. My Spanglish knows there is no other way to say sana que sana culito de rana. (laughs) My Spanglish can't tell stories uh, about El Campo in translation. Can't flirt using proper grammar. My Spanglish knows there is no other way to say, Conchale, papi, you look good. <laughs> My Spanglish has a tía sin papeles. My Spanglish has a tía that works in a factoría. My Spanglish has a tía that takes care of neighborhood carajitos. My Spanglish will never call itself broken. My Spanglish is an unwanted child who insists on being born. She is a huérfana, crying an unpaid debt of commonwealth to mainland lost in a promesa. Leche corta of impoverished Madre Patria and starved island retreat. She's the unruly second generation daughter of un-American and unstandardized. She's the endangered hom- tongue of a sanctioned homeland y un barrio cabrón. My Spanglish is always trying to create a bridge between Quisqueya, Borinque, y un verano en Nueva York. My Spanglish is a scared seven-year-old in an English-only class where Miss Marcy tells me to sit in a corner Every time my tongue resists pressing Jew into you and Jess into yes, insisting that mommy's homemade lunches are better than cafeteria food. Certain that standing on El Rufo is the only place I have ever seen stars. 
My Spanglish has an abuelito whose primary language is storytelling, but she doesn't have the time to listen. My Spanglish doesn't understand all his consejos, but feels exactly what he means when he says, I love you, nena. I love you all the way. Gracias, Instituto Cervantes, por dejarme hablar de Spanglish. Mm. All right. All right, you still with me? I got two more. Are we good? Okay. All right. <laughs> this next piece was written for a young lord. Um, I was uh, working with this beautiful group of dancers, and they wanted to honor different people of the community. And it was written for a specific young lord in mind. But then it kind of became an anthem for all my Afro-Latino beautiful hermanos, my compadres, my, the people in my family, the people that I work with. Um, and it, it was inspired by a line of Pedro Pietri's who said, aquí, to be called negrito is to be called love. Because in our communities, negrito, little black boy, is a term of endearment, it's a term of appreciation, it's a term of beauty. So it doesn't mean, it doesn't have a negative connotation to it. There is love wrapped around that. When you tell somebody, me acá negrito lindo, you're calling him something beautiful, something precious. So I kind of brought that back with Pietri, Iba Ibaye, who inspired a lot of my work. Oh, dear, I'm going to sing, so good, good luck to y'all. Um, ooh. <laughs> Negrito lindo, tú eres la bomba del barrio. He is brown sugar, melao encorbatao. Fights against the black man's burden, the boricua blues, all with a swagger and sazonao. Un hombre cordial con el tumbao de la calle. Made of East Harlem street concrete, flavored with Brooklyn cement sentiments, entered the belly of the beast, emerged a transformed man. Through academia, he redeemed his once blood-stained hands. His empowerment was self-taught. Went from young lord fitted berets to Caribbean fedora hats, expensive suits, wingtip shoes, his Ibarito smile completes that suit and tie. A once hot-headed street thug, now a classy, cool cat. He believes education helps develop tolerance. Negrito lindo! Proclaiming our people have the genes of geniuses, so we must refuse to be mules. Still releasing the trauma of conquest, trying to shed the overseer's side effects, pain slowly released over centuries. He demands more of our youth, the next generation, la juventud. Parate firme, que tú no naciste para sentarte. Tienes que ser fuerte, fuerte. Palante pa siempre. He advises them to read, speak, write well. Encourages them to find role models within themselves. Some say big fish die by the mouth, but not this one. No, sir. Él tiene la clave en la boca, que entona con el pracata y el guaguanco del corazón. Cadence of his voice resurrects the kings of the past. Calls on caciques to rise. The tempo of his speech steady with the strength of a Negro spiritual, the heat of a rumbero, the grace of el flamenco. He's a descendant of los pioneros. Refuses to be intimidated by any crowd, never to be placed in any one category, never to be boxed in. The census needs a new form for this kind of man. He is more than a simple set of words, no one definition ever evolving, lifelong learner, international traveler. Negrito lindo, orgulloso de todo lo que es de color. No set of parentheses can define, contain, or restrain this bloodline that holds the beauty of the world in each of its DNA strands. A genetic rainbow set to the soil of many distant lands that stretch to Africa, Asia, Europe, Ponce, San Juan, Cuba, Nueva York, El Bronx, aquí, Boston, hasta el monte. <laughs> he took our dark-skinned abuelas out of the kitchen and invited them to dance. Celebrated their hereditary sancocho. Savored their racially mixed mofongo. Relished in their café con poquita leche without shame. Found beauty in the tabaco y ron, mahogany hues of our people. Made it safe to say, yo soy negro. He took black, kinky, nappy, prieto, moreno. He took boricua, jíbaro, jabao, mulato, mestizo, mezclao. He took he took ex-con, boca grande, malcriado, desobediente, presentado. He took calle, tigre intranquilo, rebucero, reformado, and made it all so damn beautiful. Negrito lindo, tú eres la bomba del barrio. And for my last piece, um, 
This one is dedicated to all the young girls and women who were ever told that you were too loud, too much. Tiene la boca grande. Um, I was called boca grande my whole life. You got a big mouth, boca grande. But big mouth to me was like, okay, you're silencing me. Now I'm like, yes, I am. That's my code name. Yes, do it, say it. So this is to all the young ladies, to all the women who have ever been told that they are too loud, that they need to quiet, they need to sit, they need to be unseen. That's very detrimental. Please don't say that to us. On top of that, we might kill you, <laughs> just a little. So we will wait for you outside. <laughs> I have always been called Boca Grande. My imagination too loud for a small two-bedroom apartment, my singing solos into the hairbrush too intense. Roared high-pitched monologues on make-believe stages in the living room until the stern look of adult eyes quiet my speech. Quiet, quiet, baja la voz, niña. Silence has never been in my nature. Roared in my mother's belly, conceived from her desire, I was her wish, her prayer, her first spoken word. Born to the sound of thunder, to whisper to the dead, to shout to the living. I was born to make noise, to rattle shells, to beat drums, to dance, to chant, to dream and free verse, to bless and to curse. Porque mami dijo que así es que se reza. I may be too boisterous for church pillars and Corinthians, but I got the perfect pitch for areitos, powwows, and bembes, and God reassured me she speaks my language. Boca Grande, wear that title proudly. Use it to juxtapose the mantra fed to me by inferior boys who feared my sassy wit and pitchfork sense of humor, hoping I would buy into the belief que esta boca es buena para mamar y más nada. As my tone grew a little deeper, framing itself to fit my womanhood, I realized I was gifted this voice, these lips, to combat my height, to challenge the limitations placed on my sex, to reclaim the forbidden sounds attached to joy, to moan and stretch in satisfaction, cry in awakening, sing pleasure in staccato, give it its rightful name, scream it aloud through the night, boca grande, pero con gusto. Many have tried to impose silence on what once was born of light, of blare, of uproar to silence the ancestral voices that surge through my fingertips, that form petroglyphs on my fingerprints and possess my feet, to re-enslave the spirit of la madama, la morena, la doncella, la gitana, that have walked with me since conception, whipped them back into submission at the hands of your disapproval. Do you know the sound of freedom? It is in the syllables that escape the throats of little girls who play loud games of pretend and splatter paint on satin dresses. Freedom. It is in young ladies called desobediente y malcria for daring to talk themselves into a new form of existence. Freedom. It is in the butterflies that grew wings despite Trujillo's attempt at making insubordinate Dominican beauties extinct, ignoring the power of the collective female voice to do more than just soothe babies. Freedom. It is in the descendants of Boricua women whose wombs were made barren too soon by government doctors cutting fallopian tubes in the hopes our vocal cords would follow. Freedom. It is in the clandestine teachers that patiently instruct illiterate campesinos how to curl their soil-stained fingers around a pencil for the first time. Freedom. Ominira. It is in the mysteries whispered by Yoruba priestesses that guard sacred songs and rituals of ceremony until we are ready to receive them. Yes, I am Boca Grande, presenta, hija de Yemaya. There is no taming this ocean. My voice will continue to ripen in tune with my body, continue to command airwaves until I can no longer retain a single breath. And even then, my spirit will rattle trees and ring bells. And although you may want to dismiss it as just the wind, I will remind you that even she has a name and you will say it. Bring forth the memory of all the women throughout history who have fought to break the sound barrier, who have mended their broken tongues, who will no longer bite their lips, who will be feared by the same social norms and proper etiquette that tried to restrain them, warning them of their delicate reputación. Esas malditas de boca grande who refuse to keep still and be quiet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to spend some more time with Peggy, she's teaching a workshop tomorrow at 4 p.m. I'm super excited. It's going to be in Robinson Hall. It's free. Um, there's going to be food. Um, so, yeah. Um, Liz, are you from the Bronx too? 
No. Okay. Morning I was just Morning. what? Morning Side Heights. Morning Side Heights. Pretty close. <laughs> um, so uh, we are really lucky to have Elizabeth Acevedo because in between the time when I invited her and she came here, she's become a New York Times best-selling author. So like, thank you so much. Um, and congratulations, right, as well. So she has a new book out, Poet X, that's um, just climbing up, uh, you know, uh, book lists. Um, she has, uh, holds a BA in Performing Arts from the George Washington University and an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Maryland with over 14 years as a performing poet. Acevedo has graced stages nationally and internationally. She's the author of The Chapbook, Beast Girl, and Other Origin Myths, and her debut novel, The Poet X, has just been published to rave reviews. So thank you so much. I know you're really busy touring with that book right now, so we really appreciate having you. Thank you, Melissa, for having me here. I do about 50 universities every single semester, so I'm on the road quite a bit. I've been doing that since 2014. This is my first time at Harvard. Um, I've heard a lot of different things about this school, but when I was walking here, I saw like three eyebrow threading places, and I'm like, all right, you're fine by me. Like, I'll take it. You're good by me. Um, thank you so much, Danielle, for opening the space up with a poem to Anacaona that I think that any time that we bring the ancestors of our island into the room, that's so necessary. And to have, you know, Dominicans in the room and island folks in the room with Haitians, so often we're put on separate sides of the room, so I'm glad that we could share a podium today. Really appreciate that. Peggy, ya tu sabe. Ya tu sabe. You know, Peggy and I have conversations all the time. We both come from spoken word, and so often we're in spaces that are considered academic spaces. There's a little chip on your shoulder that you carry because you feel like this might not be a space where I can bring my performance because it's not academic enough. It's not the literary world. And I think to say that we come from people who were denied letters, and they were still poets. They were denied the ability to write, and they were still poets. And so that even in spaces of high art, this too is high art. And so thank you for always being brave in a space and saying, I bring my full self regardless of what, what you say should be here. So thank you both so much. Um, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm going to do some poems. I'm going to read from my young adult novel. I'm going to talk shit, and we're going to we're gonna feel it out together. Y'all heard in my bio, I got my master's in creative writing from the University of Maryland. And that was a fascinating experience for me. I was the only person in my program, it was a program of about 25 people in both fiction and poetry. I was the only one of Afro descent, which means I was often the darkest person in the room, which being that I'm quite light skinned is a problem, right? I should never be the darkest person in the room. I was the only person of Latinx descent who was writing from that experience. There was another woman who was uh, Cuban descent, but she didn't write about that heritage at all. And I was the only one who was from a major city, right? Born and raised in New York, if you can't tell by my accent. And that means that I would come to class, and I would turn in all these like hood morenita poems into workshop. And I would get them back, and all the Spanish words would be circled, and all the slang would be like question marked in margins. I'm like, Google's free. Like, you could have looked that shit up, right? <laughs> but this was often the space that I was in. Whereas someone who comes from a background where you are told that you have to learn the facility of walking through the world, regardless of who's in the room, I have to know more about your background than you know about your background in order to, to say I am allowed to be here, that was not the same for my classmates or my counterparts. They could question not only the, the craft of my poem, they could question the content. Is this real? So many of my poems were often questioned, is this possible? I wrote a poem about people break dancing on the train, and the questions that, you know, in workshop you have to be silent. The questions that came out were, are you allowed to break dance on the train? Were these dancers fined? What kind of train is this? Is it an Amtrak? Right? Like these are the questions of legality. <laughs> and I think in those spaces, you begin to question, am I possible? Because we can't even talk about the craft. We're still trying to figure out whether or not you believe my story. Right? And there was one experience that really made me realize like either this space was going to be what I made it or this space was one with which I had, like, I had to band it because I couldn't exist as I was trying to please so many different people in a room who did not want to see me. Right? And my professor comes to class and he was an old school dude, walked women in the face, long ass beard, <laughs> the kind of old school professor that has a real melodious voice. So anytime he talks, you want to lean in. And then he would say something real problematic. You're like, lean back. <laughs> right, that kind of professor. I like always wanted to trust him. And then he would say something. I'm like, OK, you're a man of your time. Right? Like all the things you tell yourself to try to be like, you, 
you are an esteemed person, but sometimes I don't know if you've read widely enough to do the work, right? As widely as you've read, right? That that's a hard thing to, to feel but not be able to say to someone. So he comes to class and he's like, I just read the most amazing poem about deer. And I have no beef with deer. I think venison is delicious. <laughs> I don't hate on anybody's wildlife. I think we got a lot of poems about deer though, right? So I'm sitting there like, all right, we're gonna talk about another deer poem. And he goes one step further. He says, I want everybody in the room to write an animal ode. And y'all know that an ode is a praise poem, right? It elevates something simple to a higher art. Ode to the artichoke, ode to the socks. An everyday thing elevated. And so he goes to one classmate, he's like, what would you write about? My classmate goes, well, like Elizabeth Bishop, I would write about the blackbird. Not the most original answer, right? 13 ways how to see it. I think we got it. We're good here. Let Bishop live, right? Everybody always wants to bite Bishop. I'm like, deja la quieta. She's good. <laughs> he goes to another class. My classmate's like, I would write about sea anemone. And I'm Googling on the table, like, what the? Is the sea anemone? <laughs> well, I don't know things I Google, right? He comes to me. And the one piece of writing advice you always get is write what you know. And it's my first year, and I'm trying to like impress my classmates still. So I'm like, well, one creature I know really well are rats, right? Because you grew up in any major city, you know you some rats. And so I'm hype. I puff my chest up. I feel like I'm on Family Feud, right? Like, good answer. Like, is it good? Is it good? And my professor looked at me, and in a space I often felt alone, in a space I often felt like I was under a microscope, he goes, rats are not noble enough creatures for a poem. Liz, I think you need more experiences. And I think there's something funny about the word noble. When you say that to someone who comes from the first island that was colonized in the Western Hemisphere, the first place of rupture that we called a new world. And that rupture occurred at the hands of nobility. That this is who I am to be aspiring towards that kind of writing that you consider noble. And I know it's a little more nuanced than that, right? There's a quality that I guess creatures have that I was never informed of. <laughs> the rat is not one of them. Um, but I wrote this poem. It's my official clap back to that professor. It's called Rat Ode. Um, <laughs> it's a long ass story for a short ass poem, just letting you know. <laughs> because you are not the admired nightingale. Because you are not the noble doe. Because you are not the picturesque ermine, armadillo, or bat. They have been written and I don't know their song the way I know your scuttling between walls. The scent of your collapsed corpse rotting beneath floorboards. Your frantic squeal as you pull at your own fur from glue traps. Ripping flesh from skin in an attempt to survive. Because in July of 97, you birthed a legion on 109th, swarmed from behind the dumpsters, made our streets infamous for something other than crack. We nicknamed you Cat Killer, raced with you through open hydrants, squeaked like you when Siete blasted aluminum back into your brethren's skull. The sound slapped down dominoes. You rained that summer rat. And even when they sent exterminators half dead and on fire, you pushed on because even though you are an inelegant, simple mammal bottom feeder, always fucking famished little ugly thing who feasts on what crumbs fall from the corners of our mouths, you live uncuddled, uncoddled, can't be bought at Petco and fed to fat snakes because you are not the maze rat of labs, pale, Pretty-eyed, trained, you raise yourself. Sharp fang, clawed scarred, patch dark. Because of this, he should love you. But look at the beast, the poet tells me. The table is already full. And rat, you are not a right worthy thing. Every time they say that, take your gutter, your dirt coat. Filth this page, rat. Scrape your underbelly against street concrete. You better squeak and raise the whole world, rat. Let loose a plague of words, rat. And remind them that you, that I, we are worthy of every poem. Here. Um. I'm currently obsessed with Cardi B. And <laughs> there we go. And so I'm just gonna get all my cussing out the way now. Um, 
this is a an ode, I guess, to her. I was just listening to her in my hotel room. That's not when I wrote this poem. Um, but I, I love what Cardi B represents as someone, a figure I've never been able to see, particularly from this particular descent where there's a lot of respectability. And to be a Dominican on TV, you have to be very um, proper, very, everything has to be formed in a specific way. Um, although at home you may talk a certain kind of Spanish or hold yourself however you want. I've never seen a Dominican like Cardi B ever on television or in mass media or in music. And so for me, she just represents a lot of what it means when, when you push the boundaries. So this is, um, I'm very blasphemous, y'all. I was raised very, very Catholic, and it comes up in my work that perhaps I am no longer Catholic. Um, <laughs> and so this poem is called Self-Portrait of Eve as Cardi B. Yeah, I ate it. Cause fuck it, I was hungry. And apples are natural appetite suppressants, know what I mean? You can't be mad at a bitch for trying to keep her waist snatched. Oh, you still think the snake talked me into it? Please, I lived with Adam. I been you about snakes in the grass. Didn't you know he was always dry snitching on me to pops? Even blame the apple on me? Like I forced him to take a bite? Like a hoe don't be greedy? Why the fuck would I have shared? And I'm a charmer. I asked the snake to find the choicest apple, to rattle his tail like a dinner bell when he did. And damn, that shit was sweet. I didn't even wipe my chin. Why the fuck would an untamed thing like me ever crave a shepherd, ever crave an Eden, when all I ever needed was the wild of this here wool? The manuscript I'm currently working on is um, called Medusa Reads La Negra's Palm. And uh, the, the main conceit running through it is that La Negra, a hood morenita growing up in New York, um, is trying to figure out what it means to be a beastling, to be a hybrid creature of different cultures, to be too Latina to be black, to be too black to be Latina, to continuously have to explain what are you, like what is the mixture of cultures that has existed since the beginning of our islands being what they are. And, and I say specifically the islands because there's a mixture that happened, um, and I would say this you know, for the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, that th you come to this country that believes in the one drop rule and you're, you, there's so much confusion about what you can name yourself. A lot of us come from places that do not have the language to talk about race. You declare nationality first and that is enough, right? So I did not grow up calling myself a black woman because that was not allowed. Right? I was not black. Black was what people in this country were, if you were of Afro descent. I was Dominican. And so this character has summoned Medusa because she thinks that Medusa is the most um, accurate portrayal of a hybrid monster who will get to teach her how to be the beastling she has to become. And so all these poems are La Negra and Medusa in conversation in different places. Um, this first one is called La Negra Takes Medusa to the Hair Salon. La Negra takes Medusa to the hair salon, and the salonist from Santiago runs her fingers through the serpents. It'll be extra for La Monstra, she tells La Negra. Her snakes, they hiss and squirm too much. It takes the salonist hours to bend the snakes around the rollers, make them lie still beneath the hairnet, and later, the dryer bell dings. The snakes have grown sleepy. Easier for the salonist to drag the brush through Medusa's scalp with one hand, lolling the snake straight with the blower in the other. The last of them uncoil and hang limply down Medusa's back. Oh, doesn't she look so much better? The women in rollers croon. Una propia tigerasa. They comment on how the snake's eyes have been seared and swollen shut how their tongues swing gently from their mouths, their fangs bent loose by the small tooth comb. And although Medusa cannot possibly understand the cadence of El Cibao, she fingers her half-dead snakes, holds one of them up to her mouth. Ay, negra, ay, negra, she doesn't say. La negra stoop sits with Medusa. And because Medusa got a fat ass, the boys on the block still try to holler, despite the warnings that they've heard. Bruh, 
I don't know why them soft ass Greeks were so afraid of being rock solid. Make me hard however you want, girl. <laughs> Medusa shakes her snakes, holds La Negra's hand in her palm. They sit not unlike museum pieces. The guys chatter, a swarm of mosquito wings. La Negra tries not to be envious. Medusa has spent centuries inspiring the chest hairs of boys. But still, La Negra wishes she was awful enough to make them shriek at the sun with hunger or turn completely away these brothers of hers, these kinsmen that make her all sorts of terrible, how she learns to make beacon of her eyelashes, to brace and bare her teeth sharp with barbed wire. And this is the last one from the Negra Suite. Medusa explains betrayal to La Negra. I did not look to Athena when she cursed me. I made her offerings of orange blossoms and she dreaded me in snakes. I was thankful. I already knew white women never owed me a thing before. They think they own every fragility in the world. Why would this have been any different? Already knew from the wound, another woman sometimes will raise a pointed finger, especially if their God status is at stake. I learned from this fanged crown, every creature only knows how to be its own slit self. And how could I be mad at her for teaching me? You do not pray to monsters. You step into their names and zip them to your chin. You cradle hisses in your voice. You make soft letters of your spine. You look in every mirror and make marble of your smile. Monsters are become things. Become things. Most fetching, becoming. From this specific suite, before I get into the novel, I'm just gonna do one last piece. Um, randomly, uh, well not randomly, my father was a huge Red Sox fan, even though we grew up in New York City. <laughs> and it happens pretty often and people don't always get it and it's because for the longest time, Boston had the most Dominicans of any Major League Baseball team. And so people who came here didn't show loyalties to the cities they lived in, they showed loyalties to who had the most players that reflected them. To this day, my father could tell you every Dominican player on every single team. And he just has like a tally, like this is who I root for, if they're not playing, this is who I root for. Like, and it's very random. I'm like, do you even know where that is? Okay, we're good, all right, you got it, right? Um, and I grew up really watching a lot of baseball because of him and, and just knowing a lot of different teams. But I was, uh, the summer that um, Sammy Sosa was battling against McGuire was a huge summer for me. I was really young and my father got me this massive poster, right? It was like Jesus and then like Sammy Sosa on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> this is the house I grew up in, y'all. And, um, and I just remember watching every game, right? We just rallied around this player, this, this, this negro, right? I don't know if the U.S. had ever looked at a player as dark as him who was so very clearly Dominican, who was always crossing himself, who came from, you know, who came from where he came from. And he was on every single TV, right? And everybody knew who he was. And for me as a child, I was just like, yo, this is amazing. And so to see what Sammy Sosa has done now with the skin bleaching, um, there's this very uh, strange relationship to have with the memory of a man and, and who they become, right? The memory of a hero. Um, and so this is called One-Sided Conversation with Sosa. Smiling Sammy, posted over my bed. Jesus, cross yourself, step to the plate, jungle gym shoulders swinging, tainted with the residue of oranges, the shoe shine polish from when you worked roadside, invisible under your nails. We all know the story of how you got here, slugger, Watching you that summer, my heart swelled a black island. We hung the flag from our fire escapes, spit whenever McGuire's name was uttered, counted home runs like leaping sheep. You, our beloved Caliban, taught us a new language, raised us higher than the outfield. Dark hero, dearest Sammy, your before skin supple, and beautiful as the most ripe plantain peel. That whole time, that whole time, 
We whispered and worshipped. Did you finger your oak bat? Circles rippling the oil outward. Did you wish that you were thumbing your own pale cheek? I, um, in March, released this novel, The Poet X. Um, it is a young adult novel, and I like saying that because I feel like I don't, I, I come from so many forms that are always like being called less than, and why is one of those, it's like not real fiction. I'm like, all right, whatever, like I don't care. Like these are the, the genres I choose to write in, and I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, it is a novel in verse, so the entire story is told through, uh, I won't call them poems, but through poetry, right? Because they're not always self-contained. They're hinges, they, they lead in many ways. And, and the novel in verse is not a new thing. People always think it's like this new form. It's been around for a very, very long time, right? Elizabeth Barry Browning was writing verse novels in form, right, even. And so this is not something new I'm doing, but it is something that I am trying to bring different stories into, infusing differently. The main character, Xiomara Batista, is 15 years old. She is uh, being raised in Harlem, New York City, and she comes from a very conservative household. She's supposed to be doing her confirmation, which is one of the sacraments, and instead she is going to poetry slams and dating her little boo and like hanging out at the smoke park and listening to Drake. And so she is a character that continuously gets catcalled, grew into her body very young, and is afraid of what it means to be both hyper-visible but also completely silenced on the inside. People always talk at you and you can never say anything in return. And this is how she describes herself. So she writes in her journal. So the whole thing is told through what she can't say out loud, but writes every day. I am unhideable, taller than even my father, with what mommy has always said was a little too much body for such a young girl. I am the baby fat that settled into D cups and swinging hips so that the boys who called me a whale in middle school now ask me to send them pictures of myself in a thong. The other girls call me conceited, ho, thought, fast. When your body takes up more room than your voice, you are always the target of well-aimed rumors, which is why I let my knuckles talk for me, which is why I learned to shrug when my name was replaced by insults. I have forced my skin just as thick as I am. Mira, muchacha, is mommy's favorite way to start a sentence. And I already know I've done something wrong when she hits me with that, look, girl. This time it's, mira muchacha, Marina from across the street told me you were on the stoop again, talking to los vendedores. Like usual, I bite my tongue and don't correct her because I hadn't been talking to the drug dealers, they'd been talking to me. But she said she doesn't want any conversation between me and those boys, or any boys at all. And she better not hear about me hanging out like a wet shirt on a clothesline, just waiting to be worn, or she would go ahead and be the one to wring my neck. Oista, she asks, but walks away before I can answer. Sometimes I want to tell her the only person in this house who isn't heard is me. I'm the only one in the family without a biblical name. Shit, Siomara isn't even Dominican. I know because I Googled it. Clearly Google is like a real wound I carry, huh? <laughs> Siomara means one who is ready for war. And truth be told, that description is about right because I even tried to come into the world in a fighting stance. Feet first, had to be cut out of mommy after she'd given birth to my twin brother, Xavier, just fine. And my name labors out of some people's mouths in that same awkward and painful way until I have to slowly say, si o mara. I've learned not to flinch the first day of school as teachers get stuck stupid trying to figure it out. Mommy says she thought it was a saint's name, gave me this gift of battle, and now curses how well I live up to it. My parents probably wanted a girl who would sit in the pews, wearing pretty florals and a soft smile. They got combat boots and a mouth that's silent until it's sharp as an island machete. Pero tú no eres fácil is a phrase I've heard my whole life. When I come home with my knuckles scraped up, pero tú no eres fácil. When I don't wash the dishes quickly enough, or I forget to scrub the tub, pero tú no eres fácil. Sometimes it's a good thing. When I do well on an exam, or the rare time I get an award, pero tú no eres fácil. When my mother's pregnancy was difficult, and it was all because of me, 
because I was turned around and they thought that I would die or worse that I would kill her. So they held a prayer circle at church and even Father Sean showed up to the emergency room. Father Sean who held my mother's hand as she labored me into the world and Papi paced behind the doctor who said this was the most difficult birth she'd ever been a part of but instead of dying I came out wailing, waving my tiny fist and the first thing Papi said, the first words I ever heard Pero tú no eres fácil. <laughs> you sure ain't an easy one. Yes, I'm just going to read, close out with um, two last little bits from the book. Um, I did manage to go to the coop and sign some novels, so there are some signed versions of this. As I was there, they like stuck the 20% tit sticker on it. I'm like, damn, we just got these and they're already 20% off. <laughs> um, so if you want a discounted book that's signed, you got it at the co-op. I called it the coop, the coop, right? Co-op is old school. I was told like, that's not the cool way to say it. I was like, oh my bad, the coop. Um, so this is a, a portion of the book that I was writing towards. This was like what I had as the ending for a very long time um, before revisions and Siomara has been caught making out with someone on the train. She didn't know her mother was on the next cart. And when she gets home, she is made to kneel on rice. Um, as a way, which other Dominicans often find funny. And some people are like, that is abuse. And I'm like, yes, and <laughs> like, right? Like it's all of these things. Um, and so this is uh, the internalization, what's happening while, while this moment is taking place. Cuero. She calls me to my face, the Dominican word for ho. I want to tell her this is what a cuero looks like, a regular girl with pocketless jeans that draw grown men's eyes, a girl with long hair, a nose ring, a lip ring, a tongue ring, extra earrings, any ring but a diamond one on her left hand, a girl who wears skirts, shorts, tank tops, spaghetti straps, a cuero lets the world know she is hot, she can feel the sun, she is a spectacular girl with too much ass, too much lip, too much sass, with hips that look like water waiting to be spilled into the hands of thirsty boys. Acuero is a plain girl with nothing llamativo, a forgotten girl, one who parts her hair down the middle, who doesn't have cleavage, whose mouth doesn't look like it is forever waiting. Acuero can be anything. Un maldito cuero, she tells me. I am acuero, she tells me. Maybe she's right. I hope that she's right. I am, I am, I am. I'll be anything that makes sense of this panic. I'll loosen myself from this painful flesh. See, a cuero is any skin. A cuero is just a covering. A cuero's a piece of leather, a loose thing, tied down by no one, fluttering and waving in the wind, flying, flying. My mouth cannot write you a white flag. It will never be a Bible verse. My mouth cannot be shaped into the apology you say both you and God deserve. And you want to make it seem like it's my mouth's entire fault because it was hungry and silent. But what about your mouth? How your lips are staples that pierce me quick and hard and the words I never say are better left on my tongue since they only would have slammed against the closed door of your back. Your silence furnishes a dark house but even at the risk of burning, the moth always seeks the light. Thank you all. Um, one more round of applause for all the poets, please. Um, so I invite you all now to talk to the poets, get to know them, talk to each other, enjoy some refreshments. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, there are two workshops. Um, so, but yours is full, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, come and enjoy. <laughs>